Welcome everyone to today's session. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants, along with Nicole Young, who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, which is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. We're co-facilitating today's conversation on how to harness local data to create the core conditions for lifelong learning and education with Eva Holt-Russmore and Sarah Adler from DataShare Santa Cruz County and Jason Borgen from the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. And as you can hear, today's session, like other core events, is being held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation Thanks to our team members, Stella Lauerman, who will be providing the interpretation today, and Gisela Carrasco, who translates comments and questions in the chat, and whose voice you're hearing now. So welcome, everyone. I'll turn this over to Sarah and Eva, who are going to explain a little more about DataShare. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Nicole. So my name is Eva, and I'm the program coordinator for DataShare Santa Cruz County. DataShare is a data sharing platform that is interactive and accessible. We aim to provide equity-centered data to promote community action and evidence-based policy. Um, the platform fulfills a need for accessible, reliable, quality data for advocacy, community outreach, engagement, grant writing, reporting, uh, program evaluation and a variety of other data needs. We are a collaborative and we're driven by our values and shared goals. Um, and we're creating impact uh, by meeting these needs um, with over 1400 annual users, um, 14,000 annual users a, um, per year. And um, we know that the data is being used in advocacy efforts across the county with mental health and representative government. Um, we also, in addition to having uh, custom tools around dashboards and reports and uh, specific data indicators, we have spotlight pages uh, which focus on important issues in our county. We're constantly working on building a robust database with over 470 data indicators, as well as local reports and local data. So I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about how the platform interacts with our community and how the tools are really guided through principles of equity. So we've been working as a collaborative to really think deeply about how our values can be put into um, some clear guidelines that help us think about um, think about which actions we need to prioritize, what data we need to prioritize. Um, and these working principles that you see here um, help us make decisions about our data capacity, our needs, um, data literacy efforts, communications, so that we can be best aligned with, um, with our goals and um, ensure accessibility for all of our users. So, um, you know, some of these principles are about transparency and about how we use the data to reveal inequities in the systems, um, how we share the data and analysis, and uh, how we think about highlighting the assets of people in our communities. We're really striving to uh, use the power of data to partner authentically in our communities um, with organizations of color and building capacity and um, to create meaning out of numbers. So uh, just as a quick example, we're currently in the process of updating data points on the platform from our community assessment. Um, and uh, the process of those updates has been gone, has gone through our data committee, um, which vets the indicators and um, looks at these principles to ensure that we're um, focusing on the data that is going to be most meaningful and most aligned with these principles. And uh, during today's chat uh, about the different impact areas, we'll be thinking about uh, these principles as well. Thank you, I'm happy to be here today.
Thank you, Eva. And now we want to show you a little bit about the results menu, which is what we're here to explore together. So let me share my screen and show you a little bit about how to get there. So many of you may already be familiar with DataShare Santa Cruz and have different levels of experience with exploring this site. So we just wanted to show you, first of all, how to get to the core results menu, which is on this platform, DataShare Santa Cruz County. And the easiest way to get there is to go to this local progress page and click on core results menu. You should be seeing a link in the chat if you want to follow along. And in addition to an overview of the core conditions for equitable health and well being and various tools that are aligned with that, if you scroll down, you'll see the core results menu with indicators for each of the eight core conditions. So today we're going to be focused here on lifelong learning and education on these five impact areas. And each of the core conditions has different indicators associated with it, but they're a subset of the many hundreds of indicators and thousands of indicators that are on DataShare as a whole. There, this uh, list in the core results menu is a curated, vetted list of indicators that are um, considered key to providing a portrait of each of the core conditions and the desired impacts in our county. And they're aligned with lots of other core tools um, that, as I mentioned, are available on DataShare Santa Cruz and also will be available through the upcoming core website. And DataShare was launched in 2019. It's come a long way since then, and it improves on a daily basis, thanks to the efforts of Eva and Sarah and many others. Um, but you'll see that there are still some gaps, and that's because um, data is in motion. Um, these, the landscape of what data are available and how we can link to it changes really fast. So just because something is a gap today doesn't mean that it will be forever. So some of the items um, that we'll talk about today are still in sort of a, a wish list status. And part of that is because the, um, the company that manages the data share platform, Healthy Communities Institute, um, has some criteria for data on the site. So for example, they have to be collected uniformly at certain periods or, or intervals. They have to be um, of a certain quality, but that doesn't mean that that data is gonna be missing forever. So we ask for uh, patience and forbearance. If you see something on there that looks like um, it would be useful to you, but isn't there in a form yet that you can use. And just keep checking back because th this really does change um, almost daily on the site as a whole and for the core conditions as well. And then as we'll also discuss when we explore some of these in greater detail, each of the um, core conditions and indicators and uh, data sets has a lot of information associated with it. So there might be other local reports, as we'll talk about. There might be some links to promising practices, to other activities going on locally and um, throughout the state and nation that might be useful depending on what you're looking for. So it really does reward spending some time um, exploring, and that's part of what we're here to do together today in small groups. And today, as I mentioned, our focus is on lifelong learning and education. At the end of the session today, you'll hear about upcoming sessions on the next set of core conditions. So we're going to talk soon about the economic stability and social mobility um, indicators in, um, in September. And then in December, talk about thriving families and community connectedness. So we'll keep working our way through these if you're particularly interested in any others. I also just want to mention that we really uh, recognize and the data recognize how linked these all are to each other. So while we're here to talk mainly about the interest in lifelong learning and education, I know everyone here appreciates how connected this is to other core conditions. Um, so we never look at them in isolation. So we will spend some time now going into breakout groups. And the purpose of that is to have some time together in a small group to talk in more depth 
about one or more indicators associated with some of these impacts in, in the lifelong learning and education um, core condition. So I'll give you some instructions on that. And then we'll break into groups and we'll come back together in a large group to talk about what we learned and what questions we may have and insights about that particular indicator. So um, bear with me for just a second. We'll get back to our slides. Okay, there we go. So when we break into small groups, we'll have some time together to talk about these questions. What kinds of stories do the indicators tell us about the assets or strengths of the people and places in our communities? What do you feel is missing or what gaps are you noticing as you look at, at the data that we have in front of us? And what questions could or should we be asking about any bias that's implicit in the data, any limits, the context for the data, so what can we do to, to enrich the discussion about what the indicators are telling us already? And then what kinds of programs and practices and policies are you aware of that either already exist or are needed to create the conditions for optimal lifelong learning and education for everyone in our community across the lifespan? So this is getting at some of the equity issues and gaps. And how can we build on the data that we do have to measure change and learn more about what works, to track and monitor our collective impact on this core condition and others. So these are big questions. We could probably be talking about each of them for hours, but today we just have some minutes together. So your first task getting into your small group is to have a, ideally a volunteer who will be willing to report back just some highlights from the discussion. It doesn't have to be a transcript or a lot of detail, but just what struck you as a group. And everybody will help weighing in with that when we report back. And then you'll each have a, a facilitator in your group who will guide you through these questions. And they're in the chat, so you don't have to memorize them. Any questions before we do that? I think, Nicole, that we are ready to be dispersed into our groups. Each group will tackle one of the um, community impacts under the lifelong learning and education core condition. And again, we'll get to hear from each other in, in just a few minutes. Okay, we, we may have time to go through more than, more than one of these, but let's just start. I'm gonna share my screen. And go back to that core results menu. So I'm going to click on this first one, equitable access to high quality education and learning opportunities. And there they are. So I'm hoping everyone can see this. If you want to follow along with me on your own screen, feel free. But as you scroll down in these, they tell you a little bit about the indicator. And for each one of the indicators, you can see additional pieces of data and comparisons to trends either over time or to California counties, depending on what's available. You have an option to see more data and you can see just these different levels of things to explore. When you scroll over them, you can get some glimpses of details as well. And here's what I was mentioning earlier, data unavailable at this time. So these are, these are the kinds of wish list things I was mentioning that people thought would be really important to know, but that aren't currently available in a format that would meet some of the criteria for the data share site. And this just, by the way, is a link to one of the core tools, the strategies and program outcomes. So just a reminder that all of these things are embedded together. So I'm going to go back up here and just for the purpose of illustration, I'm going to try to walk us through some of the, um, the information on, um, on children in working families that don't have licensed childcare slots available. So I'm gonna click on that. And so here we have a definition of it, an estimated percentage of children in this age group with parents in the labor force 
for whom licensed childcare spaces are not available. We have a little bit about why it's important and you can click on more. And then we have the information here about a trend. Again, if you hover over it, you can get the actual data point, if that's useful to you. You can have, you can see that the com in comparison to other California counties, Santa Cruz is in the upper half of counties, the top 50%. You can see that compared to a prior value, it's, it's in decline and it's increasing, but not significantly. We don't have, for this particular indicator, we don't have some of the more specific uh, breakdowns by demographics or zip codes or other things that can be really useful. But depending on the indicator, sometimes we have that, sometimes we don't. So what kinds of things, just looking at this, what kinds of questions do you have? What, what do you wish that you could see more of in looking at this indicator in particular? Well, it's hard to see. And even though it's our work, we don't know. What are people doing for childcare instead? Mm -hmm. So... So it raises some questions, yeah. yeah, about what else is going on. Anybody else? So one of the things we mentioned earlier is that this really, um, as you mentioned, Sita, it doesn't tell us a lot about what else is surrounding this trend or this data point. But we do have some other information. If you scroll down, there are some, some other reports. So for example, here's one on openings and closings of childcare facilities during COVID-19. That might be something that provides some information. We have the um, 2021 Child Care Needs Assessment. So even though these kinds of things are not reflected in chart form and indicator form up above, depending on what you're looking for, these might provide some information that would be useful to you. So it depends again on what you're looking for and why. What other reactions do you have to this? What else do you think would be useful to know? What, what story could it tell that it's not telling? I think the ages of the children, like are we talking infants, preschoolers, or school age? Yes, yeah, so the, that's a great question. So the indicator itself is zero to 12, but you're right, there's no breakdown by the smaller uh, segments. So trying to understand more about what that need is for what part of the day, um, what age groups, what kinds of family configurations we're talking about. Yeah, that's a great question. And then I guess all, along with that would be like, is this North County, you know, like, is there a bigger need in North County versus South County? Um, yeah, that would be interesting. Yep, those are, those are really good questions to ask about. Um, what, what can we tell by geography, by place? Um, that's something that would be really helpful. And, and again, some for some indicators, we do have that. We just don't happen to have it for this one. Um, and, and maybe in the future, that would be something um, that would be available and would be really helpful to know. Anything else that you'd add to this to make it more useful, to tell a, tell a more complete story about what's going on in our county? Um, I'm new at this group. Um, yeah, what right. I was thinking of, it was uh, demographics, uh, kind of identified the pockets of the population that are in need of the child care. Mm -hmm. um, also thinking about the FFNs, uh, providers that are at home, uh, how many of those are in the, um, providing child care in their homes, uh, 
um, how are they being supported, um, how the parents have access to them. Um, I don't know. Uh, also, maybe just more impact of how qualitative data of how the pandemic impacted um, this trend, how it contributed to it. So that was just it. Yeah, thank you, Erica. Th those are great ways to fill out this picture. Um, and as, as we can see here, we, we only have pre-pandemic data. So when we get those next data points, we might see something really different and it might raise even more questions about what happened and to which families, which families were most affected. Excellent questions. Thank you. Nicole, yeah. could you actually um, open up that or click on the link for that COVID? Yeah. Maybe open it in a new window. And because I think, you know, the kinds of questions that Sita and Christina and Erica raise are, I think, a really good example of um, sometimes what we can find in data share represents one piece of that story. And then we do have to look at and supplement that with other sources of data. Um, the, okay, yeah, the, I recognize this one from the California Child Care Resource and Referral Network. And sometimes we have to look and see, okay, <laughs> does anybody locally have that kind of, because uh, I think even this doesn't break it out by demographics or mm -hmm. geographic area. And so I'd be curious, because um, I think we ended up with <clears throat> several um, people in this group that are in the early education arena. Do any of you know, or are there sources that you look to, to when you're looking for that kind of geographic or more specific age breakdown or other demographics that you were all mentioning? I, I feel like this is a hard one because I feel like our county gets lumped into one thing because we're kind of a smaller county. But as we work with the people of our county in the different areas of our county, we know that there you know, are vast differences between what it looks like in the San Lorenzo Valley and what it looks like in Watsonville and what it looks like in Capitola even versus Santa Cruz City. So we have developed something that we haven't started using yet. We're just putting the finishing touches on it, a map, a mapping tool that we'll be able to load all our data into and see and then we can update it every month and we can get a, a history over time. I wish this is something we had before COVID because we'll be able to see which parts of the of the county have undergone changes. So it doesn't exist last month, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I'm hoping that it's going to be an, an uh, um, a useful data tool for us because for us, for our database, it's always live. So it doesn't record the changes in a graph or anything like that, that, that we can pull and see only when it's recorded like this. I mean, this information on this chart from the network, it came from our local database. It's just that it doesn't say what area of town or the county it were, were the bigger changes. But when I look at this number, 69.9% of families don't have access to licensed care. And that's a pretty shocking amount. So I'm just trying to understand that as a, as a data point. It doesn't, you know, what's going on? Because I hear that, I see that. And at the same time, it doesn't seem like the providers and the centers have the kind of demand that they're used to. You know, families coming and asking for care, signing up on their wait lists and things like that. So um, what, what does it mean? What do the numbers mean in comparison to the reality? Because if the families are not choosing to go and pay for licensed care or even enroll in subsidized programs where they might not have to pay. What's going on with that? That's a whole different um, question. And I don't know if there's a way to have any data on that 
in something, you know, uh, something like this, where we're we're doing reports on what exists, and this is it, it's something different. It seems like it can only be a survey or something like that. What what are people's choices about? So I don't know. I'm rambling, but no, it's it's a good <laughs> example of how starting with one data point raises new questions and new possibilities. So maybe there's a way to take the questions that you have and try to use those um, to have data that are telling more of the story. Um, for example, just the, the geographic issues you mentioned or the demographic issues that, that Erica raised. Um, so that's exactly why we're having this conversation to think about what are some of the, the ways that the data could be more, um, could tell us more and be more useful. There's one other thing that um, I feel like it keeps popping up, but just from discussions with the directors and even some of the family child care providers, we know that there are not enough people who want to do this kind of work and who are qualified to do this kind of work. And we know that some of the centers, their numbers, their capacity has declined dramatically because they can't find people to staff their rooms. And so they can't provide care. And I think that it's a huge issue and it's becoming dramatic in our community. And if we go, if we live in a place like Santa Cruz, where it's so expensive to live, and we pay wages to the people that take care of our children that are so low that they can't live here, we're just going to be stuck like this forever. And it does require college and experience and training to do the work. So we expect a lot and we, you know, we can't sustain it. So I, I, I'm feeling more worried than I have in the last 40 years about the workforce. Yeah, and, and Sita, that's a, that's a really important um, seg to our, our next set of questions, which were about the kinds of programs and policies that, that might be affecting these indicators. So that's one that's way beyond the field of, of childcare, although it's very acute in that field. This, the, the gap between, um, between wages and uh, cost of living. So um, what are some ways that people can be encouraged to, um, to get the, the training and education they need and to have um, ways that, that people who are skilled at this work can stay in the field and can be enticed into the field? Those are things that are faced in healthcare, in education, at all levels. Um, so it's it's a really a really valid point, but a much bigger problem than any one sector. Are there other comments either on um, programs and policies that you think are are needed here, or ways that the data point to solutions? You know, we have um, about 10 minutes left together and we have a couple people who've just joined our group, welcome. But I'm wondering, Nicole, do you wanna walk through another indicator just to illustrate some of the in sure. here? Yeah. Okay, let me stop my share. Okay. I'm going to go back to our results menu. Okay, and so we're going to um, jump down to the, the impact statement, participation in education and learning opportunities. And we'll go through a similar process that Nicole just did around the equitable access. So if we click on that, You'll see a similar kind of structure where you see a number of indicators like chronic absenteeism, truancy, suspension and expulsion rates, enrollment rate in public schools, students who do not complete high school, and then we have a couple here that do not have data available at this time. And so again, you'll see that all of them have a, 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 like a mini dashboard that if we want to get a quick glance at some of the trends, we can see those at a glance. But we're gonna focus on the students who did not complete high school and click on the see more data. 
And so again, this one is looking at or showing the percentage of students in grades nine through 12 who did not complete high school. Um, and it says a little bit about why it's important and how education or limited education levels can um, just increase the chances of experiencing challenges and barriers later on that become barriers to opportunities for stable employment and financial security. And so here, um, we can see that overall in the county, 12% of students uh, have not completed high school, have not earned a high school diploma. And if we look at the comparisons, uh, these little dashboards here, we can see that when, when we look at our rate compared to other counties, um, we're actually doing not as well as compared to other counties. Our, um, we're actually in the red zone there, meaning that our rate is worse than other counties. And also um, we have a higher rate of students who, are, who did not complete high school compared to the statewide percentage. But if we look at just our county's rates compared to the, the previous year's value, um, it's a little bit better, just not a, a significant difference. And again, the trend Hopefully this trend will continue where the percentage decreases, although it's not yet a statistically significant difference. So that just gives us kind of a, at a glance, idea of um, the trend over time. And then we can see, again, uh, the, the line graph here has got a little bump in it. So it increased at one point and then has been slowly decreasing over time. This one does show or allow us to look at some data by subgroups here. There's um, gender and race and ethnicity. So if you check off both of those, you can see the charts then showing breakdowns by again, gender and ethnicity. And so I'm gonna pause there for a moment, just um, let you kind of take a look at that and ask you what story do you see emerging here? Like when you look at the data and the trend lines or the, the dashboard up here, what story stands out for you that, that says something about um, the assets or strengths of people or our community? Is there anything that stands out that could be highlighted as a strength or asset? It's tough to go with strength first because I see all the barriers to yeah. health care and wellness in that line, but I, I'll wait for the stories I'm seeing. Yeah, and we intentionally start with asking about the strength because it is like so often the data just itself is framed in a deficit based way or like, you know, all the concerns and challenges are the thing that leap out first, but we like to kind of practice and, and build up that muscle of looking at, okay, is there anything that, that we could glean from this that tells us, oh, there's some sign of hope or something positive maybe that is going on there we might need to explore further? I think I this shows, oh, sorry. I think this shows some resilience through the pandemic. If yeah. we're looking at graduation rates, that they hung on there and despite all the disruptions and changes, um, we maintained. Yeah, exactly. Um, that, you know, when we look at the years here, so it, this does reflect uh, data from years when the pandemic was, you know, at its height. And so, yeah, that's a, uh, I think an important observation there that we didn't, we're not seeing these huge spikes, right, in the, in the line. And I so I think that's definitely know. worth pointing out. Anybody else see anything that stands out as a Oh, I'd like to asset. know what happened between 2018 and 2019. What program was, it looks like the county reacted and did something. Although mm -hmm. whether that's true or not, mm -hmm. I don't know, but I'd like to know more about that drop initially from almost 16% back down to 12. So what yeah. happened there? Yeah. So not just paying attention to things like, oh, wow, we're doing worse than the state and other counties, but really noticing that, oh, it looks like something good happen there? What can we learn about that? Uh, is it something that could be 
highlighted more, something to build on, something to enhance. Anything else stand out as strengths or assets? Okay, what about the um, concerns or gaps or challenges that stand out for you when you look at this data? Such, I know you were wanting to <laughs> share something. You This is the time you want to... I wanted to give someone else a chance to, to go first. Uh, so, of course, when I'm thinking of 12% compared to the rest of the state, or just 12% in general, we'd love for every child to succeed because there's such a close connection between health and academic success. So I think of two things, and it really relates back to workforce as well. What is the mental health of our school-aged children and their wellness? And what interventions can we provide? And then why are we not having enough mental health counselors? Why do we not have wellness centers? What are the barriers to healthcare? And I know even at our clinic, it's very challenging to have enough slots for well child visits, to have um, enough visits for mental health providers, to have families want to engage with behavioral health providers, to screen kids at the schools. Where's the workforce and money to support you know, mass screenings. We have the California Health, um, Chucks, California Health, oh goodness, what's that big survey? I only know by oh, CHKS. Healthy um, Kids Survey. Healthy Kids Survey, yeah. thank you. And we've been doing this for years and we see the amounts of victimization that occurs on school grounds and um, substance use. We now are caring for children with opioid use disorders at our clinic, you know, so, so it's just, a very large problem. And I'm glad we're all here to work on that. And that's why we need data to support. What's the story? How can we get funding to support it? Where can we get the staff to support it? Where can we get, you know, make sure that there are schools training people to be bicultural, bilingual, in all sorts of aspects of healthcare to support academic success. And then you got the social determinants of health. I mean, it's huge. So, um, so I'm actually really curious about that drop from 2018 to 19. Was that external forces or was that an actual program? Santa Cruz County reacted and supported. What about that can we continue to do? But from what I see from my patients, I mean, it's multifactorial, very large, but a lot of it is related back to ACEs, adverse childhood events. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, I love it. I love how you... Um, kind of brought in and tied together uh, kind of the multiple factors, right, that that uh, are likely to be impacting the data that we're looking at on this chart, but they don't explicitly <laughs> show up, right, or they're not explicitly. And so those are great questions to be asking, right, to be acknowledging that, you know, things like adverse childhood experiences, mental health status, um, you know, access to healthcare as a way to support academic achievement, that those are all important parts of what leads to the kind of data that we see, that it's not just about like, oh, whether or not students are motivated or, um, which is often, you know, kind of how the, the leap that people make, right? And they're thinking when they see data, it's like, oh, students just need to be more motivated. And, and here we're taking a step back and looking at what are all those other factors and influences that are, um, you know, an important contributor to that data and to those changes. And also good questions about, you know, was it really a change and improvement that happened that led to that drop that we're seeing in the chart? Or was it just a data <laughs> difference in the way the data was collected or reported? And uh, yeah, so those are all good questions. You know, it's, it's interesting to me to see the starting point be the lowest percentage and it really makes me wonder what the line looked like before that you know was that on an increase at that point or was it kind of steady at around eight or nine percent I mean yes we want a hundred percent but um <laughs> the, the you know the lower percentage is better than you know we're even where we are now and I'm just glad it's not worse honestly than than 12 percent so mm -hmm. Because um, it is, it is a struggle for the young ones. Great, thanks everyone. 
Okay, we're gonna start seeing people come back from their breakouts. I think they're the last group has maybe a few more seconds before they get bumped back to our group here. And so, yeah, Sita, you were raising a good point about even though we're looking and able to see that trend over time, it really only goes back to 2016. So, you know, it could be a good question or to see like, what was the trend like even before that? And are we really seeing progress or um, was it actually better at some point? Okay, I think we have everyone back here. Nicole, were you gonna lead the... I think Eva was going to close us out with the discussion. Great, thank you. So I think um, if we can just start with the first impact group insights. Is that us? It is, yeah. <laughs> like, there's no room numbers or whatever. <laughs> like, I do not know what, what room I was suddenly in. And are we gonna have a little question to help crazy people? Yeah, like me so <laughs> the, this, this group was talking about equitable access to high quality education and learning opportunities. So um, maybe if you can just uh, share with us, Sita, um, you know, what, what stories and what insights came out of those stories when you were looking at some of that data, if there was any, um, you know, anything that was really uh, missing or any gaps that the group um, identified, then maybe we can start there. Okay. Well, for, for us, one of the first things that we looked at was the impact of childcare and the early learning programs. And um, it's hard for me to separate what the data says on this data share thing and what my personal experience from my work is. So it's like, even in the discussion, that was a little, little bit hard, but we were concerned that the percentage of um, families that it appears that they don't have access to licensed childcare is really high, like almost 70%. And working at the, the center that helps families connect with childcare, I'm really wondering why that is and what are they doing for care instead. So as we looked at the um, the, the different data sources, there, there was a lot, uh, we, we um, you know, experimented with navigating around a little bit and looking where we could find more points. So I would want people to, I would want to encourage people to look at all the different things that are available on each section and not just at the chart because it's easier. And, um, but then we, it raised some questions too. What are families doing instead? And how can we gather data on that? Because it's not really at a place where you can collect the data, like centers, you know, who's there and how many children and um, how many people are being served. But out in the community, when people are finding alternative ways to function, how do you how do you get that information? Do you survey them? You know, what what do you do? Another thing that came up in that area was why is there not more licensed care? And part of it is that the, the facilities have spaces, but they don't have staff. So we kind of went off into a little discussion about, you know, what's causing that. And that is a, a major discussion. And then we switched to um, the, the education of older children and um, those that are not and are graduating from high school and what some of those factors are. So we could see in that chart that the percentage had gone from about 8% in 2016 to where is it now, like 12, 12 or so um, at more recent times. And, you know, I looked for some places where we could get more information about why that was happening. But um, felt like there was still, you know, more, more curiosity there. What, what caused a spike? What did we, what caused it to decrease and, and look better? And then why did it stay steady during the pandemic when there were so many challenges? So just, um, you know, the, the charts tell an interesting visual story, but then you have to dig deeper to find out the answers to your questions. And there's a lot of different resources within the data share pages that you can, um, you can see the trends, you can see the articles, you can see more information that way. 
Thank you, Sita. And I think that um, especially for that impact area, it also has a very close connection with, you know, workforce development and employment and, um, you know, just in the last few years of, you know, so many people leaving the workforce to become uh, full-time caregivers in their own families and the relationship with licensed and unlicensed and all those pieces is really the story that um, people like you um, uh, can tell from uh, your personal experience. And I think that those anecdotes are really telling. So thank you for sharing. And I'd like to go to the next impact area group. So um, quality of education and learning opportunities and environments with Sarah. Do you have someone to report back, Sarah? Cool. I think that's me. <laughs> I'm Tracy. Um, I'm the executive director here with the O'Neill Sea Odyssey. Uh, we were talking about impact to quality of education and learning opportunities and environments. I think we spent um, the initial part of our conversation really just trying to get a better picture of how to understand this data and kind of the scale and what it was telling us. Um, I there we had some different um, experience levels with utilizing this website in our group. So it was helpful to really just take a moment and um, really understand, you know, what it's, where it's, what it's telling us. Um, we spent some time really looking at uh, caring, at the data and the graphs related to caring relationships with indicator, with educators as an indicator. Um, and what I think the resounding part of our conversation is a lot of this information is really interesting, um, or sorry, we weren't talking about caring relationships. We were looking at the feelings of safety um, and looking at that information. So as we were digging into that, really having a conversation about where did the information come from as its breakdown, um, looking at gender and really wanting, you know, feeling like this data gave us a lot more questions than, you know, of wanting some more information. How do we break this down for sexual orientation, for trans students, for demographics, and thinking more about, you know, wanting to understand this, um, who these students are more and how, you know, and we really then broke it down into two separate kind of categories, I think, of like how as providers, would we align ourselves and what kind of strategic sort of direction would we want to take this information? Um, and then figuring out as providers, could we use this information to go to, you know, um, administrators or think about other ways to build partnerships um, across the county to really strengthen this information and how do we go from there? So I think that was that's a real brief summary, but that's, I think, what a big, some of my big takeaways are going to be from our conversation. That's great. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, and I think it's, um, it sounds like your group was already kind of in that mode of like, let's, let's use this and reach out to other people and understand how this makes sense to others as well. So that's great. Um, and, um, the group that talked about skills and educational achievement, that was our group, um, as well as educational attainment and workforce readiness with Jason. Um, and I don't, we didn't get a chance to have anyone uh, volunteer to be the report back person, but uh, we just were in conversation and didn't notice our time. Um, does anyone from our group want to say a couple things that stuck for them about the stories that our data told? Um, Eva, I'll, I'll share a couple things. Um, I thought it was it was it was great conversation around both the academic achievement, you know, specifically around third grade and math in the last year of the California Assessment Achievement results. I think there's some big ahas about how much we're increasing in math proficiency, specifically in third grade. Um, given that CASP had a little a hiatus during um, 2020. Um, and so we noticed that too, that uh, the last reporting year was 2019 and then jumped to 2021. Um, 
And then around um, educational attainment and workforce readiness, we showcased the disaggregation. And I think there was a, a big aha around um, the age groups between, I think it was uh, 25 to, what was it, 34 year olds uh, have a lower bachelor degree attainment than um, higher age groups. Um, and uh, similarly to demographics um, and ethnicities, uh, Hispanic and um, well, white and Asians kind of have an increased uh, attain bachelor degree attainment compared to other, um, other demographic groups. And so that was a big interesting piece specifically around also if you look at regional and uh, groups, uh, South County uh, bachelor degree attainment is, is significantly lower than the other parts of the county. And so we were able to really disaggregate between our four areas. And there are some questions around, you know, are there gaps and how do we know what those gaps are and how do we report those gaps specifically on, the, on data share and identify them to help be somewhat of a tour guide for folks, I think is the term that one person used. So I think how do we continue to support and scaffold the use of data share and help tour guide when we're not actually there? Um, is, it was a big aha uh, for, for me anyway. I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything to that. Jason, I wanted to just say something too that came up when, when we were looking at our data because so much of our, our data is countywide and in relationship to the whole state. You know, we, we, we turn in our reports to the state office and then they make a portfolio of the different childcare options and it, it's got Santa Cruz lumped into our Santa Cruz numbers and that's what we could see on the chart. But even just to look at it, we know there's a big difference between the San Lorenzo Valley and South County and the cities in the middle, Santa Cruz, Capitola, vast difference in availability, even in the demographics of it. So that's one thing that, you know, I don't have a great solution. I have an idea of, of what we can do to um, find um, or just show you know, over time, the demographics and um, the details a little bit more, because for us living in this county, it, it makes a great difference, right? For the, the whole the whole California, oh, it's just little Santa Cruz and, and we can all be lumped together. But for us, the people doing the work in the county, we need to find the target areas where we need to provide more sources of support. So we, we want to dig deeper, I think. Definitely see that. And that, that brings up a good point. I think having people share their data sources if they have indicators, because, you know, we want to highlight local data on data share, right? And so just to remind folks, there is that form to submit. If you have local data to submit, you can submit using that form and, and then the data committee will re you know, review it and be able to actually put that on the site and highlight that data as a local data source. Yeah, so and I, I, if I could add on to CETA, I mean, think about how East Cliff Family Health Center came to be five, seven years ago, because it was Live Oak that did not have or was lacking access to healthcare, basic healthcare. And Live Oak is near the beach, surrounded by high income homes. And yet, so yeah, it's very, it is really important to show the small little pockets everywhere because it's just so varied, our county and the demographics. And so um, that's wonderful to think about showing even within our own county, the different areas we live, because something as simple as Live Oak really had a big difference in access to healthcare. And luckily, someone looked at that, said we need to put resources there, and now we have a clinic there to support that area. So. Thank you, uh, Sati, for um, celebrating the way in which data has driven some decision making around uh, the uh, access to resources in our in our county. That's an incredible example, and um, I know that many of the people in this call uh, are doing that work daily. Um, and I I guess I would just I, does anyone have any final thoughts, any um, burning insights that um, weren't shared or um, that they would like to um, highlight or um, or even a, a story of success with data, even if it wasn't from this particular platform um, in your work. Well, I just wanted to um, note when Nicole Young and our combined group um, really urged people to focus on stories that illustrated strengths and how hard that was to do, um, strengths and assets. And that was where we 
heard the um, the story, the sense making about maybe the graduation rates, even though they were uh, um, troublingly, um, there, there was a gap that was troubling, it was still consistent and had happened during COVID had stayed stayed that way. So there was something going on that that spoke to some kind of resilience. And it was just really, it was interesting to have that flip and to really, um, I, I just, noticed in myself too, it's such a default mode, it's such a magnet to look at deficits and problems and um, and gaps. And so I just, just wanted to, to bring that forward because it was really striking to me in our discussion. And I, I really encourage all of us to, to do that. And thanks for the prompt, Nicole. And I wanted to add too that you know, each group focused on a different indicator just for the purposes of, you know, managing the discussion. But really, if we were to look at, you know, multiple indicators together, even, you know, from access to child care for working families and then uh, youth who feel connected at school and high school graduation rates and, you know, highest uh, level of education attains, like, you know, putting them together starts to tell a story as well and and also about strengths as well as gaps and can lead to the kind of, you know, programmatic decisions, policy decisions that Satu is describing in terms of how the Live Oak East Family, uh, East Cliff Family Health Center came to be. Uh, so the more that we kind of dig into things like data share and explore those and, and try to connect those dots, uh, the better we can tell those really compelling stories about both strengths and needs. And it is true, terminology makes a difference. I mean, how many of us grew for, for the last 20 years, health disparity, and then now we finally switched it to health equity. And so to turn it into a positive is really important, but so many of us <laughs> are still trained. What's the barrier? What can I change? You know, and so it's nice to have both languages running out there. But again, just like with children, we want to use positive words. We talk about positive discipline. So we're trying to find strengths in our community but it was very striking to see the 12 percent and like oh that was during the pandemic okay what's happening here is online actually positive for some people when we all thought initially it was going to be devastating and you know it's so stories are very interesting and i'm glad that we have this group to share and discuss and remind ourselves how to look at data what can we find what can we positive about it what can we strength off of it yeah so yeah it was great yeah and um we had an exchange with um diane before we hopped onto this community conversation together about child care and how this is an opportunity you know and around the workforce that um raises our children and how this is an opportunity in time um, to really value that entire workforce um, as the infrastructure that holds up everybody else being able to go to work. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I think that, like, as we um, are thinking about shared solutions, um, I see a lot of place um, in interaction around, you know, maybe it's that component of, like, if our uh, child care centers and our workforce of caregivers are really living, uh, having a living wage, then how does that affect the rest of our workforce and the rest of our education system? And um, yeah, so anyways, I've been marinating on those pieces as well. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us in this uh, second installment of a community conversation. Um, and harnessing data uh, for impact. Uh, Nicole, are there any final thoughts before we share when our next trainings are? As we mentioned at the outset, we have um, some discussions just like this one planned for the next few indicators on the core conditions list. So we're gonna talk about economic stability and social mobility in a very similar format at the end of September on the 29th. Um, on a Thursday from 10 to 11.15. And then um, combining the thriving families and community connectedness indicators on Thursday, December 1st, again from 10 to 11.15. And we encourage you to join, to share the word with colleagues, 
And of course, to keep exploring um, data share and recognizing that the, the gaps may lead to good stories and, and good explorations and questions as we did today. I also forgot to mention when we first talked about data share that you can um, translate everything on it into other languages and um, see it in Spanish in particular. So um, there are um, a couple of different ways to do that and just reach out if you'd like some help with that. And just wanna make sure everybody knew that. Anything, anything we're missing? I want to echo appreciation for everyone um, attending today. And it's even though um, I know I've used data share a lot, <laughs> there's something really helpful about have, being able to dive deeper into certain indicators and have the discussion and hear what others think about it as well. That like deepens my own thinking and, and learning and, and ideas about how to actually use that data uh, for change. So thank you all. We hope to, all, to see you all at the at the next session. We'll send out registration information uh, probably in a few weeks. <laughs>